What's going on, buddy? My name is Elprince. Welcome back to yet another reaction. Now, today I got another game theory video here, guys. And since I've been watching a lot of game theory recently, these uh, last couple of weeks, since I started doing uh, reactions to them yet again. Uh, well, and no, I never actually did reaction videos to them at the beginning, but I just started watching them again. I was like, why don't I just react to them? So, with that being said, uh, game. Theory just uh, Matt Pat just released a new video that came out a little not like a week ago at most, and I had just haven't gotten to it yet. It is the ultimate timeline video, and uh, knowing Matt Pat, a year from now he's probably going to be revisiting this timeline again because it's probably a new game or a new book or a new source material. It always happens to the guy. He's he's been doing this for almost a decade now. <laughs> I feel bad because he's always has to always has to come back and re-examine everything he's ever seen, and then do it once again. So the man has been through a, through a lot when it comes to this franchise. But with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and get right into today's video in three, two, one, boom! Because I'm really curious. Today we end the torment. Nineteen books, eleven games. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Eight whole years, all leading to this moment. The ultimate FNAF timeline is finally complete. <laughs> Funny enough, I have the first ever book that came out. I'll uh, grab it at the. I'll grab it and I'll take a picture and I'll show you guys on screen when this video gets edited about the first book I ever had, Silver Eyes. I, I never read it. I I, I read it, brought it to school to read it, but I just never got around to reading it. I still haven't read it today. In place for us. Now all we have to do is put this story of tragedy, jealousy, and loss back together. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the show that feels like a kid revealing the class project that he's been working on all year. Except here, it's the class project that I've been working on for the past decade of my life. <laughs> this one is big, my friends. Oh, I'm God. Kind of, kind of nervous. I haven't attempted a timeline video on this franchise since 2018. Back in the days when Mike was the crying child, Afton coming back was actually a surprise, and Fazgu wasn't a phrase I'd ever thought I'd have to utter. But Neither since did last I. time I did something like this, we've had three more massive games, the death and revival of the FNAF movie, and more robot kids than you can shake a staff bot at. It is exhausting trying to keep track of this whole franchise, which honestly is why- No matter how the movie is gonna turn out, and I've been actually catching up on it a lot on Twitter, well, no matter how the movie's gonna end up being, I'm gonna watch it regardless. I'm here today, the lore at this point is complicated. It is full of speculation. Terribly and complicated. So to hopefully make it a little easier for everyone and to give us all a baseline to talk about this franchise moving forward into the future, it's time to reveal my current working FNAF timeline. But just before I do, I just wanna explain a couple of things. First, this timeline is massive. Seriously, it is huge. This thing towers over any video project we have ever done on the channel. But really? Look at the totality of this franchise, the story of FNAF really boils down to the story of one man, William Afton. His successes, his failures, his rise to becoming co-owner of one of the most successful restaurant franchises in the world, and his eventual fall to the monsters he helped to create, only to then be reborn in a new digital form later. That's why I've decided to split this timeline into three main chunks. The foundation three eras. Phrase, how the business started and how it came into being, the Afton era, William's decades-long murder spree, and post-Purple Guy. Basically, modern FNAF everything that mm. happens after the pizzeria simulator fire. And because there are lots of new big revelations in this thing that seemingly come out of nowhere, as well as just points I want to talk about further, I decided to dedicate one episode to each chunk. I really? originally wanted it so to we're be doing three parts. seamless, continuous video, but it just felt incomplete without some sort of explanation at the end of each one. Once this whole thing's done, I promise I'm going to merge all the narrative bits into one massive video so you can just skip my explanations. But for now, this okay. just felt like the best, most satisfying, most... Okay, so I guess it's, it's going to be multiple videos and gotcha way to do this that being said this is still about the story the broad strokes of the franchise so in order to make sure that you guys know that i'm not just pulling answers out of thin air not only am i discussing some of the more controversial bits at the end of each chunk we're also putting in a handy little graphic in the bottom left hand corner of the screen which will show thumbnails video titles books and any other citations that we need throughout the video so if you wish to understand that specific statement in more detail you know exactly where we've taken bunny call that way you can look into those i haven't heard that one before for. So sit back, grab some popcorn or your pitchforks if you're the type to get upset when I say something controversial, and make sure that you subscribe since this is going to be a video that you're going to want to come back to a few times in order to fully dissect. Without any more waiting, I present to you the story of a loving, obsessive father who slowly descended into madness and along the way discovered the secret to eternal life. 
Our there story begins not in the 1980s or even in the 1970s, but what? all the way back in the 1930s. It was the throes of the Great Depression and people were in desperate huh. need of cheap entertainment, especially in Utah, one of the states hit hardest, fourth highest unemployment in the nation and full of transients. People looking for work in Salt Lake, finding none, and ultimately moving on to find their fortunes out in California. People were tired and they were hungry, but as they traveled, it was a bad was time. one thing that could lift it was a really bad time. A simple roadside attraction called Fred Bear's Singing Show. The ads were plastered all over town, featuring an animated bear drawn in the popular pie-eyed cartoon style for characters at the time. He resembled cartoons like Mickey Mouse, Felix the Cat, Betty Boop. It immediately said that this, Fred Bear's, was a place where you could bring the family. And the price? Honestly, couldn't be beat. For 50 cents, you could get food and entertainment as you watched the local trained real-life dancing bear perform on stage. Normally, huh. you only got to see dancing bears at large traveling circuses like Barnum & Bailey, where the tickets would go for about a dollar. That's a dollar without food. But this was a smaller show, like the type from the Vaughn Brothers or the Robbins Brothers, where tickets would sell What's for just a mere 50 cents. Watching that bear do tricks on stage brought a glimmer of joy at a time when so much was wrong with the world. Whoa, the hold show on. Would go on for My recording appears to be fine. So we're going to go ahead and click continue where we left off. Back up a couple seconds. Were the Robbins brothers, where tickets would sell for just a mere 50. Before we continue, I just want to say I was not expecting this part. This must be one of the Fazbear Fright. Fight. Shut up, Pound! <laughs> this must be one from one of the Fazbear Fright books. I have, the only three I know was the main three, and that's it. Sense. Watching that bear do tricks on stage brought a glimmer of joy at a time when so much was wrong with the world. The simple show would go on for years, bringing happiness to hundreds of travelers passing through Thank looking you. for a quick meal. But it left a permanent impression on one little boy, capturing his imagination in a way that nothing else had. One little boy named Billy. That was his nickname, at least. But his parents liked to call him William. William Afton. The bear could dance. It could How old is for Afton? Decades, William dreamed I of never, creating that moment. I've never considered this throughout the franchise of how old Afton was. I figured he was somewhere in his 40s, but if he's from, from the 1930s, then he must be in his late 50s, early 60s by this point. I've William never considered that. Bear to life, but how? William was smart, without a doubt, and he had a keen mind for business, but he wasn't the most creative. How do you make a singing, dancing bear come to life? The best he could do was using rudimentary costumes. William was inspired by the work of Walt Disney, who throughout the 50s and 60s was pioneering the use Making of mascot suits costumes. throughout his theme park. Huh. The big innovation? Suits with five fingers. This allowed the performers wearing the suits to use their natural arms and hands to interact with the guests, as opposed to the older models where the arms would just hang limply by their sides. Finally, with a simple mascot suit, he would be able to realize his childhood dream. He would be able to bring Fred Bear to life. To appeal to the kids, and for copyright reasons, he changed Fred Bear from a <laughs> realistic brown animal to a cartoonish yellow bear with a purple hat and bow tie. But feeling like one character wasn't enough, he added another friend, a yellow rabbit with a purple vest and matching tie named Bonnie the Bunny. While Fred Bear was certainly his first love, Bonnie was extra special because that was his. It was an original character that he had created from scratch. And I do mean scratch. William's hand-sewn costumes were rough with seams and stitches visibly showing, but it was the best that he could do. And you know what? It was just enough. Bonnie and Fred Bear oh, were so that's where the, small, but where the, the trap variation comes from. Finally, he was able to deliver fantasy and fun to all the kids, delighting and inspiring them in the exact way that he had been delighted and inspired so many years ago. And things could have ended there. That could have been the end to his story. It could have been perfect had it not been for one thing. Other people saw the success of his idea and they wanted in. Enter Chica's Party World, a rival restaurant starring performing animal characters. His idea, except they did it better. William may have been the first, but obviously he wasn't the best. It hurt the prideful William Afton to admit it, but this restaurant was able to do the thing that he always wanted to do, make the animals actually come to life. All of the performers in this restaurant were robots, simple metal skeletons that were powered by battery packs, but all of them able to freely turn and talk and dance on their own, no human required. It was like magic, magic that came from the mind of a brilliant creator named Henry Emily. This Henry, in some small way, had been able to harness the power of life itself. Afton admired him. He was jealous, to be sure, but he also looked upon this man with- Oh, he was in the Silver Eyes. Well, like I said, I never finished watching the Silver Eyes. ...was a small cabaret stage featuring an elephant magician. On the other, a hippo known to ramble on oh God. and on. That one was more of a joke for the parents. But it was the main stage that was for the kids. A rocking band of characters featuring a yellow chicken thing with a southern drawl. There is no, wait, what is it say? 
Well, I just want to read that. That was for the kids. A rocking band of characters featuring a yellow chick. Was the original stage performer. However, an undamaged render doesn't exist. thing with a southern drawl gotcha. named Chica, backed by a band of other country-themed characters. Okay, so I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't know anything about the other Fazbear Fright books. I only know about the first three from uh, what Matt has said in the past. Any other reference material from them? I have no idea. A pig with a banjo, an upbeat frog from the local swimming hole, and a brown bear with a heavy southern accent. Wait. A bear? But bears were his animals. Why not a cow or a horse? Something to fit the country theme a bit better. Why did it have to be yeah. a bear? And adding insult to injury, they had the nerve to call this thing Ned Bear, a direct copy of his own Fred Bear. Whoops, that's gonna leave a mark. No, that was not okay. Athens' <laughs> jealous admiration turned to hardened bitterness. A bitterness that would only grow over the next couple of years as families continued to choose Chica's party world over Fred Bear's. William just couldn't compete with the appeal of the robots. Eventually, his restaurant would go bankrupt, only to get bailed out by, of course, Henry Emily. Another insult, another humiliation that William wouldn't soon forget. 1979. Despite being bitter, Afton couldn't deny that what came next was a period of massive success and expansion. With the two franchises now merged into one, it was the best of both worlds. Afton's ideas with Henry's robotic expertise. The two men decided to launch under a new name, Fred Bear's Family Diner, a pizza chain that would eventually come to feature a of humans in performing suits, as well as on-stage animatronics. They decided to stick with Fred Bear as the headliner, considering the Yellow Bear was easily identifiable as a brand, and because he was the original performing animal mascot. Afton appreciated that. This new <laughs> restaurant would also see a mix of characters as the two franchises merged into one, with Pig Patch and Happy Frog performing right alongside Fred Bear and Bonnie. And, as part of this one big Fred Bear family, they even got themselves official merch that were released, ranging from masks to magnets. The crappy Mr. Hippo fridge magnet? <sighs> That said, not all the characters were winners. The reception to some characters was just mediocre. So they faded <laughs> away into the dumpster, storage units, and retro budget tech stores of lost nostalgia, waiting for their chance to step back into the limelight if and when a headliner went out of commission. Others, though, would fare much better, like a new pirate fox, as well as a blue guitar playing variant of the yellow Bonnie Bunny. Ultimately, the franchise would get so big, it would spawn its own cartoon show, Fred Bear and Friends. Business was booming. In the end, Fred Bear and Bonnie's popularity would be so strong that they would be able to support the Fred Bear's Family Diner franchise all on their own, while also spinning off a new sister location dedicated to their friends. In 1983, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza launched, giving a dedicated home to all this new supporting cast of characters. Chica the Chicken, Bonnie the Blue Bunny, Foxy the Pirate, and of course the headliner, a brown Freddy Fazbear. Business was good, and Afton was happy, mostly. It did bother him that the one original character that he created, the one that he himself played, Golden Bonnie, got passed over for inclusion in that cartoon show. The only character huh. in the roster of regulars to get ignored for the show, but other than that, things were going smoothly. He had himself a wife, two sons, a daughter, he had a thriving business, and best of all, he was able to learn the craft of robotics from the man that he both loved and hated, Henry. Together, they were constantly pushing the limits of what these characters could do. Because it was quick and easy, new characters introduced into the roster would be given a simple hand-sewn suit with five fingers that any performer could wear. Eventually, Henry would design one of his signature animatronics for that the spring locks? utilizing a divided mouth with either a hinged or sliding jaw design. This was the first generation of animatronics. But why stop there? Afton had big ideas. What if the animatronics weren't just locked to the stage, but could freely roam the restaurant and interact with the kids? What if his mascot suits could become animatronics? What if you could use more than just rigid metallic skeletons? Why not experiment with tubes and wires that would give the animatronics fluidity and flexibility while still providing structure? The possibilities for this technology were endless. Afton fell in love with robotics. He had started with a dream of bringing one simple singing bear to life, but with robots, he had stumbled across the tools that gave him the ability to control life itself. And thanks to Henry, he was practically speedrunning his way to an engineering degree. And while William wouldn't admit it out loud, one other thing that kept pushing him forward was the desire to beat his former rival, to prove himself smarter and more capable, to surpass the man who everyone else considered to be a visionary genius. But pride cometh before the fall, and tragedy <laughs> was about to strike. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part one of the story. That said, at the end of each of these chunks, 
chunks, I want to break down some of the logical leaps that I made since the more narrative okay. format doesn't give me much of a chance to justify a lot of the big decisions. And admittedly, there are some large leaps in here. Let's just start off with Fred Bear's singing show, shall we? We know, based on the <laughs> retro poster that was hidden in Security Breach, that at least at one point, Fred Bear was an actual bear. And like I called out in that narrative segment, dancing bear shows were a real form of entertainment. The only problem is that, timing-wise, none of our main characters would be the people in charge of that business in the 30s and a series of pizza restaurants in the 80s without him just being extremely old. Best case scenario, if yeah. Afton's running the singing show when he's 18, that still puts him at nearly 70 when the first Jesus Christ. opens and his murder spree begins. That just doesn't make a lot of logical sense because he doesn't no. become mortal until his first death in Springtrap. That's why I suspect that Fred Bear's singing show was either a family business that Afton then carried on to a new generation or something that he saw as a kid and just wanted to recreate when he grew up. The Fred Bear singing show thing also starts laying the groundwork for some of the core elements of the story. That Freddy's was a place of fantasy and fun, and that Afton, despite eventually falling to become the heartless serial killer and mad scientist that we know him as, began as someone with good intentions and a love of entertaining kids. He wanted to bring things to life from the very beginning, a theme that recurs a lot for him throughout the rest of the franchise. Next up, let's talk about those mascot costumes. One thing that I keep going back to is the design of Glitch Trap. It's a handcrafted suit. You can see the seams and everything. Yeah. It has five fingers for the performer's hands. It is very much not a spring trap suit. This so it's a separate much suit. More rudimentary. It came at a time before animatronics were a part of the story. That's why I suspect that it was actually the first, predating literally everything. It's also <laughs> a suit that is very personal to Afton. He put his digital consciousness in that form. It's his personal avatar. It's the way that he sees himself. There's also a whole separate discussion to be had here about the habits ah, and rituals of serial killers. So the fact that he's choosing to lure kids and kill them in this particular suit actually says a lot about his emotional attachment to it. So while Fred Bear seems to have started as someone else's creation, Golden Bonnie was uniquely Williams, giving him a personal connection. And that's not all. In this whole franchise, only one set of characters have themselves five fingers. The Nightmares. Even Golden Freddy, yeah. Fred Bear was a five-fingered wearable suit at one point in the story, as we see in this shot from the graphic novel, before he, like everyone else, was turned into an animatronic. This seems to imply that all of the main characters had similar wearable mascot outfits at least at one point in time, and that whoever is having the FNAF 4 nightmares, if they even are nightmares, something that we'll touch on in part two, saw those mascot suits specifically. Lastly, we have to talk about the elephant in yeah. the room. The literal elephant, Orville Elephant, as well as the rest of the mediocre melodies. For a while now, I've suspected that the mediocre melodies played a much more important role in the story than just being a bunch more animatronics to fill out the roster. Especially Ned Bear, which is just so suspiciously close to Fred Bear. And yet, there are two key details that we're going to have to justify with any mediocre melodies mention. One, they're very rudimentary with external battery packs, implying that yeah. they come very early in the timeline. And two, we know that, at minimum, Mr. Hippo does eventually become an official member of the extended Freddyverse. But if these things are supposed to be cheap, generic ripoffs, why would you be trying to rip off yourself? You wouldn't. You would be stealing huh. someone else's ideas. So if Afton created Fred Bear, there would have to be some rival franchise. The only other person who would likely be ripping him off? Henry. We've talked extensively about how the mediocre melodies are clearly Henry. Oh, I didn't see that video. Thing, so it just has to be him. I don't think Henry's doing this maliciously. He doesn't strike me as the type. He was likely building the robots at the orders of someone else that was running a rival restaurant franchise. But that's enough motivation to start Afton down a path of jealous rivalry, but also begrudging admiration. As the Freddy Files Ultimate Edition says, it's important to revisit the beginning of Henry and William's relationship. So here you go. I think this is where it begins. Also, this is future Matt Pat here coming back to add this one in. Seems like the recently released character encyclopedia has backed up all of this speculation. It's an encyclopedia it's now? written for about a month now, but I've also been holding off a bit to see what wrenches this character encyclopedia might throw into it. And on this particular point, I might point, need to I look say, into it. It seems like we might actually have nailed it. They actively call out the suspicious similarities to the main Fredbear crew. Quote from one of the pages. Ned Bear looks like an imitation, altered just enough <coughs> to avoid copyright issues. I don't know about you, but that seems to imply that we were right on the money. Knowing huh. all of this, at one point, the franchises had to have merged. That's really the only way that you get Mr. Hippo from the rival <laughs> franchise as part of the Fazbear crew. This also mirrors a lot of what happened in the real-life history of Chuck E. Cheese, with two rivals... Which I have seen. I've seen everything about that. I watched uh, the rise and fall of Chuck E. Cheese 
last year. Several restaurants, each with their own casts of characters, merging to become one unified brand. Again, we've gone into that in detail with other videos, just wanted to remind you all of that here. But why yeah. would I call out the <clears throat> rival restaurant as being named Chica's Party World? Few things, actually. First, we know for a fact that a location named Chica's Party World exists. It is mentioned in the source code teasing <laughs> sister location. Yep. So it is out there somewhere and doesn't fit cleanly anywhere. Second, in the story <laughs> The Puppet Carver, Chica is very explicitly looped in with the book versions of Pig Patch and Ned Bear, implying that she started as a mediocre melody. Thirdly, her design just fits better with a the theme of down home country animals with southern accents playing the banjo and eating with bibs. <laughs> and with her being the headliner of the show with her name on the restaurant, it would make sense then that when the restaurants merged, she was the one that was added to the main cast of characters while all the other mediocres faded away. It's also why when Freddy's closes after William's killing spree, she's the one to branch back off into her old franchise and is therefore missing in sister location. A detail that's bothered me for years at this point. It yeah. might also explain why William decided to stuff his first dead kid into Chica. That one was Henry's creation, not his. Is all of this a big leap? Yeah. Is it connecting a lot of dots that are very spread out across the franchise that I've been holding on yeah. in the back of my mind for years? Absolutely. But I think it makes sense. It also serves as a clean answer to a lot of the random threads that Scott's been leaving dangling for years. So, with all of that in mind, my friends, we can close the book on the foundation of Freddy's. And don't worry, next week I'll be back to give you arguably one of the most confusing parts of this entire timeline situation. Part 2, The Afton Era. I promise, it will actually yeah. Yeah, it's going to get really confusing. Around. I am just as eager to get this one out the door as you are to watch it. I promise. You know what else I promise? I promise that we'll actually get to talking about the games. I would have liked to have talked about them in this episode, but there just isn't that much in the games that helps us depict anything pre-family dying. Yeah, true. Well, they the never went as far back. Just about the, book, the games never went as far back as the... As 1983, at least from what we saw in the video games. Jesus Christ, what the hell is with all these books? <laughs> I st the only book I've ever had is The Silver Eyes. What happened after 2015? We were decoding images and source code that Scott fed us through the website. The modern day books and the clues that we get from those things, now they're just modern extensions of that. All of it yep. is crucial to understanding this franchise and its lore. Unless, of course, Steel Wool finally gets around to making that Fred Bear's Family Diner game they want to make so badly. I have always would love to do is get kind of back to... I have no clue if we'll ever be able to do this, but getting back to kind of like the origin of like Fazbear Entertainment or the mm. origin of of uh, Freddy Fazbear. But in the meantime, while we wait for that inevitably cryptic game, I hope that this yep. start to the timeline helps to fill in some of those gaps. What's that I'm picture? To share part two with you next week. If you haven't subscribed and rang the bell, make sure you do it now so you're notified. Oh, I will definitely be watching that video. Oh, I had the stretch. Um, when did this video come out? Let me check real quick. 12 days ago, so it might be out by now. I'll see where it is, and I'll get to it in a later video. But with that being said, guys, hopefully you enjoy today's reaction video. I've got quite a bunch of game theory videos coming up for you guys. Quite a few that scrubbed my attention, and for, not, not all of them are Finance at Freddy's related. All the ones I've so far reacted to were Finance at Freddy's based. But I got a couple of different ones up for you guys, including a much more recent uploaded Genshin Impact uh, video he made which is um one i am going to be looking at in the near future because by the time this video probably comes out version 3.5 would have already started by now so i will get to that video when i can which will probably be somewhere in the middle of the march late at march i'm not too sure yet i have figuring out videos as i go because now i'm going to be recording a lot more video games in the near future and we'll just, we'll just, we'll just, I'm just playing it by day at this point. But hopefully you guys enjoyed today's reaction video. Please like and subscribe also, guys, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.